What helped me pull all this together, uh, especially in looking back on it, was uh, an essay that Richard Wagner had written called On Conducting. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when I read it, except I know I read it when I was in graduate school, so it would have been roughly in the same, same period. And let me just say a few things about, about Wagner. Um, uh, Wagner actually stands to the end of the 19th century, what Beethoven stood at the beginning. Uh, Beethoven's uh, heroic symphony, as I mentioned earlier, uh, marked the end of the classical period, and actually Be it was really the beginning of the romantic period that you find uh, in the 19th century. Beethoven and then and Schubert, uh, Berlioz, uh, Weber, uh, and, and of course, because Wagner himself, and then, and then Brahms, uh, and, the, and the great, great operatic composers, Verdi and Puccini. And Beethoven basically is the one who opened all that by kind of shattering all the conventions and all the forms. And when, when you speak about, about romanticism in music, or it would also work in other uh, art, uh, forms of art, you're talking about really not being so bound to the form, but more to the, to the, to the expression of the feeling. Well, well, Wagner took that, and he took it so far that it basically shattered romanticism. And really, if, if you'd ever take a course in modern music, what used to be called modern music, like, the 20th century, it would invariably begin with Wagner, because Wagner is the bridge. Uh, the harmonies that he, that he introduced in Tristan and Isolde and Parsifal really kind of stretched the, the laws so far that they broke them. So, so, so Wagner was an extremely influential composer. You know, whether you like his music or not, uh, nonetheless, his, uh, his influence was enormous. However, he was not only influential as, as a composer, he was also very influential as a conductor. Right? And he wrote this, this essay on conducting. Uh, and it basically marked the, the beginning of a whole new school of conducting. Uh, it would be hard to, to imagine more influential work. At, at the time that, that he, he lived, and he himself conducted a great deal, uh, the basic way of conducting was epitomized by Felix Mendelssohn, the great composer. And this was a way of conducting that was very uh, faithful to the, to the letter of the score, all the notes, and was basically one of keeping time. Right? That, that, that the conductor was seen as someone who made sure that, they, that the musicians came in on time, that they played their notes in unison, and they ended up on time. Right? And, and this drove Joe Wagner crazy. He felt that, uh, that music had to be more than that, and that one had to penetrate to the soul of the music. And he spoke of the melos, M-E-L-O-S. And let me speak a little bit about that. Uh, it's a Greek word uh, that, that means song in Greek. Uh, and from that, of course, our word melody has been taken. Uh, it, it's also associated with the, uh, with the Greek island in the Aegean. Um, and everybody has heard of the famous statue of Venus de Milo. Uh, which was found, I think, in the 19th century. Well, in Greek, you would call it Aphrodite of Milos, uh, of Melos, excuse me. Right, that's the, that's the island. But, but the word that Wagner used to describe the uh, Melos was, uh, was really talking about the essence of the music or the, or the soul of the music, that one had to go beyond the notes to its deeper meaning. All right, and he ranted and raved as only Wagner could at, at conductors who basically only became timekeepers right, and who did not penetrate to the essence of the music. And one of the things he, kept, he would say is you have to listen. All right, and he, he said in conducting the most important thing is the tempo. That's what determines how, how the piece is going to be played. All right, but he said you cannot know the tempo of the piece unless you know the melos. Unless you, unless you hear the underlying melody. Uh, in one of the translations of uh, Wagner's essay, the, uh, uh, the translator says that, that melos means melody in all its aspects, which really means not just the notes, not what we think of as a melody, but, but the inner melody. Right. Uh, Gustav Mahler, who was a great conductor and composer and Wagnerian, once said, what is best in music is not to be found in the notes. What is best in music is not to be found in the notes. Uh, the great conductor, Wilhelm Furtwängler, which I'll get to, to in, a, in a little while, spoke about how you have to hear what's behind the notes. Right? And the great violinist, Isaac Stern, spoke about the silence between the notes. 
that all that, that's where the music is found. You have, to, you have to get, in other words, to use the language of the course, you have to get beyond the form to the content. And Wagner's point was if you don't hear the inner melody, then what you conduct may be accurate, but it'll be wrong because it will have missed the essence of the music. <laughs> Right. It would, it, to use, to say what the Course uh, says, it would be the triumph of form over content, which, which Jesus uses, which is a phrase he uses to talk about what special love is. It's a triumph of form over content. Well, that's what Wagner was, was talking about. Right. Uh, and therefore, he believed that there was only one right way of performing Beethoven. Now, he did not necessarily mean that in terms of how every performance had to be exactly the same. What he meant was that, that there was a, an inner melody that was constant, that didn't change. And when the conductor uh, experienced that and could become one with that, then that's what would infuse the performance. All right, that it would become a, a live experience. It would not be something that, that would be dead. This basically started a whole school of conducting, and it basically set up a, a dichotomy, which you find to this day, in, in conductors between those who would, be, who would be faithful to the letter, who would have every note exactly right, that every note could be heard all the time, the, the rhythm would be, would be totally accurate, uh, as opposed to those conductors who, uh, to use Wagner's terms, would, would identify with the inner melody and would flow with that and out would come. The, the music, which meant every performance would be a new experience, a, a recreation. But it all hinged upon the conductor being able to hear the music, hear the inner music. Without that, then the notes then became came empty. Right. Right. Uh, in, our, in our time, in the 20th century, the two conductors who represented both sides would be Tuscanini and Furtwängler. Again, it's it's somewhat oversimplified, but nonetheless, you could see in Tuscanini, who was at literally and absolutely tyrannically faithful to the note. When when you'd hear a performance by Tuscanini, I never heard in person, of course, but his records, you'd hear every note, right? unless the the acoustics were so bad you couldn't hear them. But and 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 the rhythms were very very. Very, very, uh, very, very clear, and that's what characterizes the Tuscanini performance. Uh, Fritz Wanger, on the other hand, was exactly the opposite, right? and and he he really came from that that Wagnerian school, that that believed in in, in bending melodies, in, in bending tempi, so that it would fall in line with this this inner melody, the the melos. Uh, Wagner is the one who first introduced what in Italian is called called rubato. R-U-B-A-T-O, which in Italian means robbery, to rob something with someone who robs. And what robato means is that, that in any musical phrase, you will rob uh, some, uh, the time from one note and give it to another so that there'd be more elasticity. Right? It makes for a much, a much, uh, much, much more enlivened performance. And Fritwanger really became a master of that. Right. The point of all, all this was that when I, when I read Wagner's essay, and I've read it a number of times since, uh, since my graduate days, uh, and translate it to what goes on with people, and specifically in terms of psychotherapy, that Wagner, Wagner's ideas really can be applied so that you could hear, so you could understand that what he's talking about right, is, is listening, is being able to hear the inner, the inner music. Right. So that your response then is to the inner music, not to the outer music, not to, not to the behavior, not to what people are saying, not to what people are saying they're thinking, but you hear something else. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's a passage in the psychotherapy pamphlet where Jesus talks about how, how the curriculum by which therapists are, are trained in this world is a curriculum in judgment. And we'll talk, we'll talk later on a lot about, about judgment because judgment is what interferes. Right? Judgment is what does not allow you to hear the, the, the melos, the, the, inner, the inner melody. Right? When you suspend judgment, then, then you could really hear. <laughs>